Brett Kavanaugh and the Corruption of American Law Schools, curing manspreading with a bottle full of bleach, and Alex Newman on the possibility of global tests for morality, next on The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Duke. This is the show that covers the stories impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses across the nation. Greetings to all of our loyal listeners and welcome to our brand new ones. It's an honor to have you with us. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere else to make sure that you never miss an episode of The Dr. Duke Show. It is free to subscribe. Thank you for allowing us to keep you informed about education. Coming up later in the show, we'll be talking as usual to our international correspondent, Alex Newman, about a new pending global test for standardized morality in our schools. So stick around for that. But first, I want to bring on my graduate teaching assistant, Katie Petrick, for the top education stories making the rounds in the news today. Katie, welcome aboard. Oh, good to be here. Uh, we learned this week that if you attend Yale Law School, you don't actually have to go to class as long as you're protesting Brett Kavanaugh. Um, so students announced early this week that they wanted to protest the confirmation confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh. Um, he's obviously being uh, attempted to be confirmed for being a Justice Supreme Court, and he's a Yale alum. And these students are protesting against the uh, claimed assault allegations up against Kavanaugh right now. So naturally, Yale law bowed down, and we learned that 31 classes were canceled on Tuesday so that these students could go protest. Um, NBC's Shannon Miller actually tweeted out a video of these students, because some students took the five-hour road trip all the way to DC, but um, some of them just stayed right at Yale. And so they're sitting there in wearing all black because they were instructed to wear all black. They're silent and they're on the floor of the main uh, in the main hallway of the school building for Yale Law. Yale didn't bow down. Yale didn't wasn't forced to back down here. It's not like you have a Yale Law School that is wanting to defend free speech and wanting to defend the law and the Constitution against tw 11th hour uh, uh, accusations that have not a single shred of evidence supporting them. No, this is not what Yale is doing. Yale is the Yale administration is more than happy. In fact, I bet, bet you my bottom dollar that there are Yale Law School administrators who are counseling these students how to protest. And what really drives me nuts about this is that these are the future lawyers who are going to get the best jobs in the country. You got Harvard and Yale Law after your name. Sadly, you can pretty much write your own ticket. And what this demonstrates to us at Yale is much less important than the Constitution, much, le much less important than due process, much less important than one of their peers who got a good education in law 25, 30 years ago, as opposed to the one they're getting now, rather than defend the rule of law, rather than defend due process, uh, rather than cite law, or even become uh, sit in classrooms studying law so that they can be justices themselves one day, and they all, the Yale Law School goes all in on this stunt. From the administration down to the students, they're sitting there in their, I get it, their black robes, sitting there in their black robes, passing judgment on one of their own in defense of some of the most absurd last minute no evidence allegations that we've seen. Uh, nothing like this since the Bork, the, the Borking of Justice Bork. So uh, Yale's all in on this. And again, you ask yourself, are we really, are the, the highest law schools in our country, are they really teaching kids law? Or are they teaching kids social justice? And I think we know the answer to this. The law for many progressives, particularly at law school, big law schools, the law itself is subordinated to the Machiavellian aims of social justice warriors. All right, well, we have Heather Gerken, who is the Yale Law School Dean, and here's what she had to say. I, say, I, I want to see what you say about it. Uh, the allegations of sexual misconduct against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh are rightly causing deep concern at Yale Law School and across the country. As Dean, I cannot take a position on the nomination, but I am so proud of the work our community is doing to engage with these issues, and I stand with them. Except, you of course, they're took, sitting. You <laughs> just took a position. Now, I can't take a position, but I completely 100% support the fact that my law students are ditching classes and professors are letting them do it to sit here and protest. I, I, I can't take a position on this. Dean Gherkin? Boy, what a, Gherkin. What a pickle she is. She's right? in a pickle. She can't take a support. She can't take a position. She can't support a position, but she kind of just did. She did. I'll finish. She said, I stand with them, except, of course, they were sitting, uh, in supporting the importance of fair process, the rule of law, and the integrity of the legal system. She says, fair process, 
Nothing about due process, but just a fair process. Uh, Gherkin said that 50 faculty members have signed a letter to the Senate Judiciary Committee urging a fair and deliberate confirmation process. Yeah, fair and deliberate means hold it up, stall it, delay it. Let uh, victims, 35-year-old victims, not 30, 50-something-year-old victims who are reporting crimes from 35 years ago without any evidence, with any corroborating evidence, uh, to uh, dictate the process to a Senate Judiciary Committee. We'll show up when we want to show up. We want to be able to testify without you testifying back. We want to be able to testify uh, after Judge Kavanaugh. Let him make a statement. Then we'll lecture Kavanaugh about all the things he did without giving him a chance to reply. This, none of this is fair process. None of this is due process. What you want is the removal of Justice Kavanaugh, because even though he's one of your own, even though he is a remarkable jurist, even though to any uh, uh, objective account, he has served the bench well and vindicated uh, the money he spent at Yale University to get that education, you're embarrassed about him because he doesn't share your social justice values. He's too white, he's too male, he's too much of a choir boy. So the kinds of insipid juvenile allegations that are being lodged his way, of course you're gonna take them as if they are already 90% true. And here you are, Dean Gherkin. There you are. Uh, What's one thing that I I looked up because I was kind of curious to see, I mean, Kavanaugh is a Yale alum. And with those Ivy Leagues, they are very supportive of their own, except in this case, we, we know. But right now on the Supreme Court, we have five justices who have attended Harvard Law, even though the notorious RBG did not graduate, she went to Columbia, but she did attend Harvard. We have three who are Yale. So if we can get, if Kavanaugh is confirmed, it would be a, a 5-4 split. And you would think Yale's would be in favor of that, but... I guess we'll see what happens with it. But that, that itself is a sad comment. Yeah. It is. That almost the entire, well, really the entire Supreme, Supreme Court, Court is Harvard Law or Yale Law. And it's been a long time since Harvard Law and Yale Law were primarily concerned with law as recorded, law as precedent, law as constitutionally based. This is all now about social justice posturing, about using the tremendous cloud of those two Ivy League schools uh, to transform even how we, we, even the concept of innocent until proven guilty now has to be transformed uh, by these activists. And the activists are in the school, they're not just the students, they are part of the 50 faculty members basically writing a letter, and we, we think somehow that these protests, these, these brave student protesters are doing something that is challenging the Yale administration, they're abetting it 100%. Yeah, well, we have some more law student shenanigans. Uh, this is actually happening in Russia. We have a feminist activist and a Russian law student who's named Anna Devgalyuk. Uh, she's apparently fighting the patriarchy by going on the St. Petersburg metro and dumping a bleach water mixture onto the crotches of unsuspecting men who are men spreading. All right, she released a video manifesto, that's what it's called, of her committing these assaults on 70 species, as she says, and boasts of how strong the solution is that it eats away the color of the fabrics in a matter of minutes, and so you can't repair You you gotta tell the audience, in case you don't know, give us a definition, what is Man spreading. So according to her Instagram, she's promoting the video and she says man spreading is a disgusting act that is being fought with around the world and it is hushed up in us. Men demonstrating their alpha manhood in the subway with women and children around deserve contempt. If you publicly show what kind of macho you are, we will publicly cool you off. So basically a guy sits down on, on a seat and his legs kind of naturally open just a little bit and she doesn't like that. So. so. Men who sit on subway seats or buses or trains and don't have knee to knee. By the way, as a man, as a red blooded American man, which is to say, you know what I'm trying to say, the idea that I could sit, given the anatomical realities of manhood, with my knees together is so bloody uncomfortable. Talk about squeezing lemons, man, I'm telling you. This is a totally unnatural way for men to sit, and it's a good thing you can't see below the table here, right? Men trying to sit knee to knee is, is a, for, well, let's just say for conservative men, it is a physical impossibility. For beta males, uh, like progressives, I suppose they could pull it off all day. This is not natural. And what I love about this, so you got, you got a, an activist, right? Who, a Russian graduate student, law student ag- activist, who whenever she's on a bus, whenever she's on a train, she carries with her a solution of bleach, right? And she then goes up to any poor guy whose legs aren't, locked together, right? Any guy who's sitting like this or like this or like this, and she sprays bleach into his crotch. Well, it's a full on, she is, it's in a water bottle and she just full on dumps dumps it. 
and she's so proud of herself that she assaulted 70 she's different proud. men. And nothing's happened to her. And for nothing doing is happening. She nope. says, and I actually found a quote. She says, uh, she doesn't think people are going to go to the police to file a report about genes. Look, can you imagine in the American media if this was going on, if some male who was uh, slut shaming some women was pouring bleach onto their genital area as a way of making a statement, this would be considered a chemically dangerous hate crime. And what I love about this, and I just mentioned slut shaming, these liberal feminist activists, this is what happens when feminism and progressive ideology transcends the rule of law. It's, there's a reason we've got this story following the one at the protests at Yale. What are the real world consequences of this disconnected from reality, stupid kind of radical uh, academic feminism spilling out into the real world outside of the, hall, the ivy covered halls of academia? You get this kind of stuff. This is a young woman, a feminist activist, who I guarantee you, if some man complained about the way she was dressed, if some man complained about the way she was sitting, you know, if she was sitting on a bus, right, in a skirt with her legs spread and some man complained about that, she would be the first one to say, you have no right to slut shame me. That to critique any aspect of my clothing or my posture or my per public persona is to project your male values on me. You are, you are shaming me by your warped male perspective. And yet, even though she believes strongly that that's true, she has no problem, wait for it, not shaming men because that's what she's doing. She is nut shaming them. And the thing that gets me about the stories is every one of the man, men whose lap she's dumped a bleach, they weren't wearing short pants. They're wearing long pants, right? It's not as if they're wearing short shorts, right? And, and the family junk is hanging out. They're wearing pants that go all the way to the floor. They're just, their only uh, crime is sitting with their knees slightly askew. And, she, and the idea that she can go ahead and nut shame these guys, right? Anything you say to me is slut shaming and you're a pig. Anything I say to you is justified by the nature of my feminism. That is the fascist nature of feminism on display. What the rules we demand, the concessions we demand, we will not give you. The violence we, we accuse you of, even though you've never been violent, is the violence we will manifest between your legs if you happen to sit in a way we don't like. Slut shaming, meet nut shaming. And then uh, she has done other activism type things. Um, she has this one called upskirting. There you where go. Where she had a, had a woman go to, in, you know, the various bus stops or in the metro, and as you see, hold up her skirt because of what's happening, and it's happening around the world where men or women, who knows, uh, take cell phone pictures up people's skirts. So this is her way of protesting and, and fixing it by having another woman just right. So having another up. young graduate student stand there in her tidy blackies, right, with her, her dress pulled up above her torso. This is not, anybody who objects to this yep. is politically backward. Anybody who objects to this is slut shaming. Anybody who objects to this is, is, has got real misogynistic problems while she's meanwhile like, going around dumping bleach in men's crotches. And I'll tell you this, if she is on her way to Moscow now, I would so love it if she tried to do that. Can you imagine trying to nut shame Vladimir Putin? What do you think would happen to this little pretty girl uh, this little pretty girl graduate student, law student, if she actually tried to nut shame Vladimir Putin. Well, I actually read there was something where Hillary Clinton tried to do that. Basically said that, oh, that's what, you know, anytime I was in a room with Vladimir Putin, he was, he's manspreading too, so. Well, I mean, I suppose Hillary Clinton is the one woman who, who actually could claim to go testicle to testicle with someone like uh, Vladimir Putin, so we'll, we'll let that one slide a little bit. All right, so we're going to switch gears here. Uh, let's talk about STEM education because we, as a country, are focusing on STEM education a lot more now. And the National Science Foundation is spending more than $1 million on training two dozen, 24 uh, students to become social justice math teachers in Philadelphia. It's up to 1.2 million. Uh, this summer at Drexel University, they rec basically recruited 24 students who were earning bachelor's degrees in STEM fields. And they said, hey, we will train you and basically give you what would equate to a minor in education uh, if you go out and teach in Philadelphia school districts. And they got this grant, and so it's going to be a five-year study, and it, the study is, quote, to promote social justice teaching. So the specific wording in the grant from 
uh, the National Science Foundation is, the project will use recent scientific, mathematical, and educational knowledge to prepare and support the 24 pre-service teacher candidates with an emphasis on understanding the culture and life experiences of students in high-need schools. They mean urban schools when they talk about it. The project intends to promote social justice teaching, which emphasizes connecting science, mathematics, and engineering instruction to students' personal experiences and culture. Yeah, there you go. So once again, federal money being spent to take something as rock rib solid as math and science and to turn it into another useless exercise in progressive social justice education. These are kids who obviously at Drexel are capable of doing STEM careers. We're going to hijack your STEM careers. We're going to take you out of the laboratories. We're going to take you out of the, uh, the, the wonderful places you could work for government, for technology, the ways you can advance knowledge of science and mathematics across the world. We're going to take you out of that. We're going to give you a teaching degree. And doesn't that just say it all? We're going to give you a teaching degree, which is to say a, degree, a worthless degree in social justice drithering. We're going to take your math skills. We're going to water it down with a handful of cash and a teaching degree. And then we're going to send you out into uh, uh, rural, rural and or inner city? Or inner city. Inner high, city schools. High need schools. And they high want, need schools. They're, they're hoping that they would teach at least five years mm, in Philadelphia. Yeah. And so these students who are science minded, math minded, really focused, are now going to be thrust into these teaching education seminars, which I've sat through many, and I know what it includes, but they did identify that they will have seminars related to mindfulness and developing emotional intelligence. Yeah. We're going to talk about social and emotional learning and the crap that it is coming up with Alex Newman in a little bit, but I want to point this out to you. You want to know what's really unqualified? There's no argument to be made. You know what's really socially unjust? What is unjust is teaching kids who sign up for math classes and teaching little kids who want to get better at science to co-opt that education with your progressive politics, to pretend like you're using math to get them to teach, to become progressives, is socially unjust in the extreme. So it's a bait and switch. What you can do to promote social justice is teach inner city kids to be the best mathematicians and best scientists possible. I can think of no better way out of poverty and ignorance than that. But you have taken those courses and the kids that could go out and become great mathematical role models themselves and you're giving them a handful of money and a meaningless teaching degree. The degree is itself is only going to be about social justice progressive politics and you're going to infiltrate inner city Philadelphia classrooms to tell these kids not how to become better mathematicians but how to be mindful, right? How to vote for uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama through your mathematics curriculum. How to oppose Judge Kavanaugh through the quadratic formula, how to use the Pythagorean theorem, theorem, right? To stop men from opening their legs on the subway. Way to go, Drexel. Way to go, National Institute of Science. Way to go, American taxpayers, for getting railroaded into funding this garbage in the name of compassion. Yeah, and then we go to Florida, where it only gets better, because we have a teacher in Port St. Lucie, Florida, who's claiming that she was fired for, wait for it, giving students zero because they didn't hand in any work. So Diane Torado is an eighth grade social studies teacher at Westgate K-8, and she claims that she was fired because she gave out zeros. Uh, she wasn't allowed to say goodbye to her students, so on Facebook she actually uh, put a picture of the message that she wrote on her whiteboard before leaving the classroom. It says, bye kids, Mrs. Torado loves you and wishes you the best in life. I have been fired for refusing to give you a 50% for not handing anything in. So Mrs. Torado was new to the school district this year, but she's a 17 year teacher. And she uh, learned about this no zero grading policy after some of her students didn't turn in this uh, two week project that she had. And she, so they, she gave them a zero, they complained. And then she discovered that in their policy, and it states in all red capital letters, that no zeros are to be given to a student. The lowest possible grade is 50%. And she questioned, if there's nothing to grade, how can I give somebody a 50%? Ah, uh, Mr. Abba, you're so, you're so deluded. See, this is, this is the problem. We, we educated this woman in math. That's our problem. We educated her in math. Social studies. Doesn't matter. She obviously <laughs> had a basic education in math because she knows turning in nothing doesn't ah, give you half the points, right? Go. 
That is the new cultural math. That's what Drexel's getting millions of dollars from the federal government to teach STEM students to go into Philadelphia and teach. And actually, this makes perfect sense given the messed up nature of our schools. You do zero work, you get 50% of the points. That is liberal economics right there. You do nothing, you contribute nothing, you add nothing, but we're gonna start off the bat by giving you 50 points. And what this is, and this is even more sinister than this, it's not just cultural math, it's not just common core math, it's not just the argument that uh, giving kids zeros for nothing, giving them what they've earned, is hurtful to their widow feelings. This is more than that. Most of the schools in America today, public schools, have to have a certain number of students passed on to the next level. If public schools aren't socially promoting kids, if public schools are failing kids because of their academic performance, then the school is punished. Then the school gets less money from the state, the district, and the federal government. So what's happening in the school's social promotion? We're promoting any kid with a pulse, and even some that don't have pulses, simply because to not do so costs us money. So by giving kids 50% for nothing, you are only 10 points away. Think about that. Kid shows up, he, he's got 50% for turning nothing in. That, he just needs 10 more points, another 10 points, another 10% to get a passing grade, a D minus. So you've made it really, 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 really hard for anyone, for any reason, to fail your classes. And if you give them 50%, basically just for showing up, then they have to do what? Maybe one out of every 10 assignments and do it badly to be able to pass the class. And there your, your, so, your socialist uh, progressive worldview is validated. We're passing these kids. Not only that, but the school's happy because we're sending them on up, up the, sh the ladder here and we're gonna get all of our funding from the state and the feds. Everybody wins except that kid when he's trying to make change for you at Sonic. That's the problem. I don't even know if he'd get into Sonic. Yeah, I don't let Sonic take him. I don't know, but I have seen that actually happen where their mind just melts. Boy, when they don't have that that change function on the oh, yeah. cash the cash box, right? Ooh. When they actually when you when you throw a loop for them, it's like you right? doing math. Oh man, when it's when the 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 the, uh, the bill for your Sonic Footlong is a dollar and twenty cents, and you give them what? <sighs> right? I mean, you you, <laughs> you throw them for a loop by giving them a the dollar bills and change, or you give them it, the, the, watching them melt down is one of the great priceless comedy routines of the modern world. But again, you see, this is part of the social and emotional wellness. We can't give kids zeros for zero work because their wellness will suffer. Their, their social wellness will, func will suffer. They will feel bad. Who yeah. cares if they're doomed for the rest of their lives to be dependent on the, to suckle at the teat of big government uh, p pity programs, because that's all you're training them for. Yeah, Mrs. Torado said uh, since this has happened, she has gotten multiple job offers from private schools, and she feels that's a blessing, and she says she doesn't want to go back to public school education. Yeah, I, I said, don't know e why. E even though she's a social studies professor, she obviously had a numbers-based math curriculum, <laughs> and she can figure out that zero plus zero doesn't equal 50. In American progressive government schools, it does there it is. Okay, uh, Time Magazine, a couple weeks ago, because it's back to school time, uh, Time Magazine did their uh, probably annual feature on how uh, teachers are treated across America. So a couple weeks ago, uh, they had several different covers to their magazine talking about how teachers are underpaid. Um, and each, they had each teacher kind of explain who they are, and all of them the covers end with, I'm a teacher in America. So the one that got me was, I work three jobs and donate blood plasma to pay the bills. This is what it's like to be a teacher in America. And this, in the article, the teacher earns $55,000 annually. Say that again. This teacher earns $55,000 annually. Do you make $55,000 no, a year? Even close. You don't. How, and you, have a, you have a degree in? Well, in education. And a master's, master's degree. degree. Political science. And you, make, you don't make $55,000 a year. And how many jobs do I work? At, exactly right. Exactly Caramel right. apples. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, the same woman said, I truly love teaching, but we are not paid for the work that we do. And uh, if you read the whole article, there's, it's a lot of these sad stories of these teachers. $55,000 a year does not take into account the lavish public school benefits. The, for nine months work, the lavish retirement, the lavish healthcare benefits that they get. I'm a university professor. I got way more degrees than you do, right? And having said that, 
an average high school teacher with 20 years experience is going to make a lot more over the course of their career than I will. A typical public school high school teacher who has 20 years in will, will dwarf what the average university professor makes from, from beginning of career to end. And their benefits in retirement will be infinitely more luxurious. So I, you know, I have a hard time processing this. And then you go to this. What if we started writing stories like this? I have a degree in education and a master's degree in education, and my kids can't do math at a fifth grade level. We, how about that story, right? This is Teachers in America Today, right? I have students who don't show up to class, who don't turn any work, who get, immediately get 50, 50 points, half the work, credit for half the work. This is what it's like to be a teacher in America today. I teach at Drexel, where we get millions and millions of taxpayer dollars to teach STEM kids to ignore STEM and become social justice warriors while pretending to teach math and science. That's what it's like to be a teacher in America today. I am a teacher at Yale Law School, where I cancel class so my $150,000 a semester students cannot learn anything and go protest Brett Kavanaugh. That's what it's like to be a teacher in America today. That was poetic. It was poetic, man. It was poetic. Uh, no, well, <laughs> and I, I want you to affer to the, uh, uh, to the audience. No script here. You're no, no cue cards. Yeah. That's 100% Duke. I feel bad for all of you. All of you feel bad for. Uh, we, we have a case study coming out of Oklahoma because uh, this kind of ties in. Right now in Oklahoma, they are in kind of mass chaos in terms of issuing emergency certifications for teachers because they can't get their teachers uh, to teach anymore. Well, we know back in spring, uh, this is the same state that had a bunch of teachers walk out for nine days because they were protesting low salaries. And the state increased their like average pay by $6,100 and they still walked out. And uh, I guess now looking in July and August, they were trying to get all the teachers, you know, to see how many vacancies they had in that in Oklahoma. And they found out that there were still 500 vacancies and they had already issued more than 1,400 emergency teacher certifications. So who's teaching your kids in Oklahoma? Look, I lived in Oklahoma for six years and there is no doubt that Oklahoma teachers make less than a lot of other teachers across from state to state. But the other thing that nobody wants to talk about is the cost of living in Oklahoma. I lived there was really, really much more manageable than it is. I could see if you're making $55,000 a year in Manhattan to be a teacher. That's a problem. I get it. But Manhattan teachers, I promise you, aren't making $55,000 a year. So New York, if, if you look at the National Education Association, they release the annual salary rankings. And for the 2016 ranking that was before then, the 6,100, Oklahoma was second lowest at about 45,000, mm -hmm. okay? New York was the highest at 81,000. Right. $81,000. for nine I'm just months. looking at it like, for, Yeah, you're just salivating. Ah. Wipe, wipe the, we gotta get you a spit guard for that mite. I'm telling you, that is $81,000 for nine months work plus a very lavish retirement program, very lavish benefits. You know, the thing about this is, is that when you look at how teachers have performed, look, I get it, but when you look at how our kids are performing, you look at how the unions are protecting rapist teachers. We did a story last week about a 29-year-old teacher who's performing oral sex on children in her classroom, and she gets a 10-month sentence and she gets to keep her teaching license. If you wanna clean up what's going on with the teachers, if you want, I think America would reward really good teachers better. But where can you point to public schools collectively where, where our public schools are doing better than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago? When you look at how the public schools have become places of social and emotional learning, where they've become places of sexual indoctrination, where, as we're going to see in a moment, moral standardized tests might be working their way into your kids' public schools. Why in the world would we pay you more? The one thing we hired you to do was teach math to fifth graders, and you're not teaching math to fifth graders. They don't know it. Eighth graders can't read at an eighth grade level. That's what the NAEP scores show. So the question I have for you is if we're going to give you money every time you threaten to walk out for more money, do we have a right to take it back from you every time a m majority of your kids don't make grade for the grade they're in? How about that? W w let's play fair with you. If you get 100% of your kids to, get, uh, to be able to read one grade higher, if, if we can get 100% of your kids to read one grade higher than the grade they're currently in, we'll give you a $10,000 bump at the end of the year. Correspondingly, if your eighth graders are reading at a sixth grade level, by the time they finish your eighth grade class, we pull $10,000 away from you. How about that? Would that be a nice fair system? But that's free market capitalism, and you're not gonna find an explanation of that in American public schools.
Yeah, you're not. Uh, we're going to switch gears here, go on the college campus, because we have Cornell University, another one of those Ivy Leaguers. Uh, they have a list for incoming students, and they are being categorized as being privileged or oppressed. So before the uh, freshman student orientation, the student ambassadors were given a packet, and in the packet, it had a list of 15 categories, um, and these are student ambassadors who are talking to the freshmen, that basically defined if you are privileged or if you're oppressed or marginalized. And so obviously it was gender, gender identity, race, class, uh, nationality, religion, ability, all these different categories. They even had size as a category. Um, your ability to use- Size of what? Si your si physical stature. Okay. If you are too tall or too short, Ooh, you are oppressed or marginalized. Okay. But if you're just right. Anyway, uh, they had all these categories and this was being given to Cornell. And of course, Cornell says, we don't want to comment on this. So, mom and dad, Cornell is a typical Ivy League, like, like Harvard and Yale, typical Ivy League school, tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars per semester to attend these classrooms. Before your kid even sets foot on campus, your school now, Cornell, has rated them without knowing them, without meeting your kids, without giving your kids a chance to read or write or talk in class, without administering a single test to your kids, before they've even spent one night in the dorm rooms, your kids have already been assessed and judged on the basis of their race or their class or their gender or their size, their size. whatever it is that we're measuring, that <laughs> they've been judged. Your kids have been prejudged. Pre what in the world are you thinking it, sending your kids to these colleges? They have decided what your kid is before he even sets foot in the classroom. How can can real education take place in an environment like that? Can you imagine, go back 50 years, and your kid comes to campus, right? Okay, we, give the, we, get, we, we put the black kids in the unair, oh, you're black, we're gonna put you in the unair conditioned room in the basement, right, with all the cobwebs. Oh, well, your family was on the Mayflower. We're gonna put you in the air conditioned building up in the penthouse, right? Because what's the difference here? The kind of measurements are so utterly superficial. The message you're telling kids from the moment they step onto campus is you're worth more than that person. This person had the benefit of a private tutor when she went to school, you didn't. You're morally, ethically, and educationally superior now to that person. This whole notion of privilege, this whole notion now of bean counting your kids on the most superficial of all possible ways, not on the characters or their contents, God rest your soul, Martin Luther King, not on the, the, the excellence of their ideas or the diligence of their hard work, but on their color or their shape or their size or their weight. This is the kind of stuff that universities, you, you used to send kids to school for, to learn to think beyond such superficial, meaningless traits. Now, they occupy 90% of what goes on at your universities. It's the main reason you're there, to be told you have too much and you should be ashamed of yourself. Or you're, you have too little and you're a victim who's entitled to everything else. Maybe, 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 instead of giving everybody 50 points for turning in nothing, why don't we take those 50 points and start parceling them out to the most needy, right? So we'll give you 50 points. You show up to class and turn nothing in. I'm gonna give you That's 50 what, points, right, to start. Okay. But then I'm gonna take 50 points away from the A student kid who's here every day because he has a mom and dad who stayed married. That's an advantage, it's a privilege. So we're gonna take 25% away from the kid who shows up every day and give them, add them to the 50 points for the kid who turned nothing in. That means the kid who turned nothing in, his grade is now 75%. And the 100% A student who's privileged, who had justifiably lost those 25 points, she's getting 75%. And lo and behold, Everybody gets a 75%. Isn't that the answer? Equality. Equality, man. That's it's equality. It yeah, so just to go over a couple categories to clarify them. Uh, if you take a look at the list, basically I, I did the list for myself and I am privileged in 13 of the 15 categories. And the one- Surely <laughs> not size. No, that's the one, one that's of the ones the I'm not, of course. Uh, yes, the size and appearance ones, but it, it's, what they're telling these freshmen, just looking at age, they're saying that if you're in your 30s to early 50s, you're privileged, and if you're younger or older, you're not. So these are all college freshmen. They're all about 18 to 22, maybe. You but know, let depending. that take in. If you're a 50-year-old non-traditional student, you are a, a radical minority on the campus. You are a, somebody with a unique worldview that the kids will not otherwise hear, but you've been branded as privileged. The minority is branded as privileged. I was branded as privileged when I went back. Uh, and then the other one they had is your education level. You're privileged if you're a college graduate. You're, you are oppressed if you were high school. 
these kids are going to college to get their college education. So, of course, if these kids take a look at this, they're going to, of course, be like, well, I am so oppressed. I am so marginalized. And then fight back against it. I know a lot of high school kids who are running their own businesses, who are following their dreams, who are interning at companies they really like, who are much more intellectually privileged than the average $60,000 a year in-debt college senior with a major in women's studies and a minor in creative writing basket weaving who's never going to get a job. Privilege is purely in the mind of the beholder, right? You keep pretending universities that that stupid worthless degree you're charging them tens of thousands of dollars for really does trump hard work and initiative. It doesn't, but you can pretend. Well, we are learning that that uh, bas- underwater basket weaving major that you had really will not pay you. A new study, a uh, new survey that came out um, from Payscale they did the they kind of do this annually where they take a look at all the college majors and your ability to get a high paying job from it obviously the majors that mean the most out in our uh, society will get paid and those are engineering and math and science degrees the ones that don't get a lot of money are the women's studies and social science type majors and humanities well now we know why women's studies majors are totally bitter right mm-hmm. besides the fact that they our scol- our, our, our intemperate harridans uh, absolutely convinced that they have every right to pour bleach between your legs if you're a man sitting with your legs uncrossed. The fact is, is that going into these careers isn't pre- ter- terribly productive, but it what makes them so angry, right? Notice what the, the people who major in these things, and I'm a humanities professor. There was a time, believe it or not, where there was tremendous rigor in the humanities. There was a tremendous societal benefit for majoring in English because it meant that you could write well, read well, you could pick up any of the world's great books and engage with them. You can't do that anymore. That's not what we're training kids to do. And so the idea that uh, we see the bitterness of these, what are they asking for? What are these uh, unemployed women's studies majors demanding? A end of capitalism. We shouldn't pay the the engineer, the guy who keeps the roads safe and builds the bridges, keeps the building standing. We shouldn't pay him more than the bitter, unshaven feminist scholar uh, sitting in her patchouli underwear, Mm -hmm. right, sipping camel tea. We we should pay them equally. Take 50% away from the engineer, privileged, and give it to the patchouli-smelling, underarm hair-having, underarm hair-braiding feminist underwater basket weaver. Give him 50% of what the engineer makes, call it equality and move. Alyssa Milano, this is what she wants. Imagine Alyssa Milano, right, uh, as she's out protesting everything, since she can't get actual acting jobs now, demanding exactly this. Freedom. Freedom to take money away from those who earn it and give it to those who don't in the name of fighting privilege and equality. All right. Well, Lydia Frank, who's the vice president of content strategy at Payscale, I think she had a a nice quote. uh, So everyone should listen up if you are a student. It's about critical thinking and communication skills. When we ask employers about skills that are lacking in new college grads, we thought it would be technical skills. But what we hear from employers is often the new hires right out of college are lacking things that you think everyone in college should graduate with, which are communication skills and critical thinking. Critical thinking. That means being able to argue multiple sides of a perspective. That means being able to engage with people who have different ideas. That means in being able to think for yourself and not following a script handed to you by some hairy, braided, underarm uh, uh, proponent feminist. Critical thinking is exactly what you don't get in universities. And you used to get it in the humanities. You got technical thinking and technical training in the hard sciences. Math r- r- uh, honed your logical skills. But critical thinking really was a, an adjunct of good humanistic edu- good rigorous humanistic education. You don't get it anymore. What you get is rote talking points. What you get is social justice posturing. What you get is pretending that black is white is white and black in the name of remedying societal evils that have nothing to do with critical thinking, everything to do with political posturing. So, you know, in a way, I suppose it's useful. Um, the free market is a very powerful tool. They're not going to pay you feminist warrior. They're not going to pay you, social justice agitator. That's why uh, what's happening in the country is uh, bad players are beginning to organize discontented social justice warriors into mobs like Antifa. This is called baiting, right? Mob mentality. The, The very universities that are driving out these majors, these worthless majors, who are turning the entire humanities landscape into one long digression on social justice. These kids then graduate from the universities who ruin their lives. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt in some cases. Can't get jobs, can't get work. Don't blame the universities. They blame the system. Then they get recruited by hacks like Bill Ayers to go become Antifa warriors, right? Where they engage in throwing bricks through windows and pooping on cop cop cars. 
Consequently, it's a vicious cycle, right? And then along comes the Bernie Sanders huckster who plays to that demographic and says, the reason you're in this situation is not 8,000 bad choices you made, it's some evil bank somewhere that took away your freedom. And hence we have social revolution. That's the ultimate objective. I'll put, you this, put it to you this way. Those creative writing, writing feminist humanities indoctrinated majors, the one thing they do make is good cannon fodder. <laughs> That's true. They do that. Uh, okay, so we're going to switch back because today we're doing a lot of law school stories. So we're going to go to law school at there's Emory. Kav there's Kavanaugh in the air. Kavanaugh in the air. Uh, we're going to go to Emory University, where, according to Inside Higher Ed, Emory law professor Paul, uh, Paul Zweier was suspended from teaching earlier this semester for using the N word in a torts class to discuss a case involving racial discrimination discrimination. Uh, so in this first year law class, he was discussing a 1967 case involving a Texas man who was refused service at a professional luncheon by a venue manager who called him a Negro. And while Zweier may have been careless and possibly using the N word instead, he meant no offense and would have led, uh, he would have explained exactly why he would have said it. And this is what he said. Uh, but basically now what's happening is he is being relegated to only teaching non-mandatory courses for the next two years so that no student is obligated to take his class. I mean, this is the Orwellian nature of this. How many kids sitting in this professor's class had on their headphones and their earbuds that word screamed at them through some rap song? I'll bet you 50% of the kids in that professor's tort class had on their, their iPhone music where the N-word was screamed it, with drums beating in the background. And yet this professor, in discussing a slur that was aimed at a person, may have misused the, word, the N word for the word Negro, which made the, exactly the same point. He was not advocating this. He was using it to describe case law. And for that, he is removed from the classroom and told, you will never be allowed for two years to teach a course that kids have to take, because somebody might have to take it and listen to you. If you can't, in a law court, if you can't, even for the sake of illustration, use certain words, how long before the word rape? is so offensive that we have to call it the R word. Because that's where we're heading, right? How long before all sorts of words now that have any triggering effect whatsoever on any weird little minority group have to be abbreviated? And I know this is true. We're already abbreviating the great books of literature. Huckleberry Finn, right? Can't use the N word. Can't use the, even though, as Ralph Ellison, the great African American novelist, called Huckleberry Finn one of the most moral, if not the most moral book on race ever written, it was a one long example of how not to be racist. But now we got to block out the N word because some social justice warrior today, who's again got Dr. Dre or he got Snoop Dogg and wording it up in his uh, Snoop Dogg is so old the kids don't listen is, is to he, Snoop anymore is he Snoop Lion still I no I think he switched back I'm not sure they're into Drake and all those other people. again the anyway. word is cultural gold if you're a rapper mm -hmm. if you want to be a hip young kid you greet each other that way you bump the arms and you, hey my, I'm not going there because I'm not a hip young kid you're right I am old but again, any word that is so casually used by the very people who claim to say it is impossible to hear without fainting, the hypocrisy meter just kind of goes off a little bit. Well, and this story gets even more sad because Weyer volunteered to revise the teaching manual for his textbooks to address inclusive ways of covering racially <sighs> sensitive topics. And he will work with a small group of student leaders and faculty members to promote and participate in dialogues on racial sensitivity. He will also complete sensitivity <sighs> and unconscious bias training. He has agreed that the, each of these actions is appropriate and he's in full support of them. So the professor's response to a slip of the tongue when making a point that was meant to combat racism is to say, mia culpa, mia culpa, mia maxima culpa. I'm worse than you said I am. The word escaped my mouth. Even though I didn't mean it racially, even though I was trying to make a point, even though there was an educational reason that I might have substituted one word for another, mia culpa, mia culpa, mia culpa. Not only am I a bad guy, I'm worse than you're saying I am. And whatever you do to me, I'm 100% deserving of, of more. Guys like that, kind of hard to feel sorry for them. Okay, up next we have Dr. Duke talking to Alex Newman about a global test determining morality in the classroom. 
Alex, government schools have demonstrated time and time again they do a lousy job educating kids about math and science and writing. Now they're going to get into, evidently, the morality business. Talk about the coming standardized morality tests for our kids. Well, that's exactly what's happening here, unfortunately, do. So the government in the United Arab Emirates, which is there's seven of these emirates on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, I think I've been to six out of the seven. And uh, they're very un-Western, shall we say, right? Like if you land in Dubai, which is the most Western minded when it's you land at you know, Sheikh Zayed Airport, and you drive down Sheikh Zayed Road to Sheikh Zayed Hotel. So basically, the, the government there has commissioned this. Uh, they're calling it the Morality Education Standardized Assessment from the organization, the American organization that produces the American ACT test, which is uh, one of the most widely used standardized uh, assessments in the United States. And what it's supposed to do is measure the morality and the moral education of children in government schools in the Emirates um, on a, in a standardized way. So uh, this, of course, they have global ambitions with this, and the test itself is, you know, rather than being a test of traditional Christian morality or, you know, Judeo-Christian morality like we would have in the United States, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not, you know, et cetera, uh, with the basis in, you know, biblical teachings, uh, the, the morality that these kids in the Emirates are being taught is a weird fusion of Sharia, you know, Islamic law, where, you know, you can have four wives and you can beat them if they don't behave and things like that. Uh, and globalism. In fact, they've been very open about the globalist component of it. They, they bragged in an official press release about how this is going to um, help prepare the students for you know global citizenship and uh, the common values of humanity and all these wonderful things. And, and of course, the uh, governments in the Emirates are very globalist in their view. It, for, for the last six years now, they've been hosting what they call the World Government Summit. You know, it is really interesting that it doesn't dawn on anybody that the idea of a standardized morality controlled by a central agency is not a standardized morality, standardized morality, it is an imposed one. And so what you're doing here is you're taking a complicated issue like morality, and at, at best morality is a system that allows us to try to see commonality among different worldviews. This is le really leveling off any kind of moral code that doesn't conform to what the testers are looking for. And in this case, you've got the American company behind the ACT, one of the primary exams kids use to get into college, uh, behind perhaps promoting this at a much bigger level globally is the ultimate aim is the college board David Coleman architect of common core is the college board who ex who uh, has worked with the ACT just to, to common coreify ACT exams is he anywhere to be found in this I'm 100% sure that uh, they're looking at this and thinking, hmm, how do we get involved in this market, right? Uh, because that's where this is all going. You know, this uh, morality education standardized assessment, the MESA they're calling it, um, they, they actually brag in the press release announcing this, that it's based on this social and emotional learning, which is at the heart of Common Core. It's at the heart of the Every Student Succeeds Act that's being used now to standardize and dumb down education in the United States. Uh, and it's a global trend, right? They're no longer interested in giving children children the tools to educate themselves, for example, reading so that they can access all the accumulated wisdom and knowledge of humankind uh, over you know, all of written language through all time. Now they're interested in uh, you know the values and the beliefs and the attitudes and how do we give your children the right mindset and the right moral code that uh, aligns with our globalist agenda. And so uh, what we're seeing here is this kind of globalized education system and the ACT creators, the David Coleman over at the College Board with the SAT and the Common Core uh, and the Common Core system, the U.S. government and Betsy DeVos still today. You know, just recently we talked about how she signed on to the G20's uh, UN education goals. Uh, so this is all kind of converging into a single global education system that they've actually been boasting about for quite some time. It's just you won't read it on the front page of the Washington Compost or the New York Slimes. But that's where this is all headed. And, um, you know, they're not being very secretive about it. Mom and Dad, whenever you hear the word social and emotional learning, and it is in every one of your public schools from kindergarten through high school, whenever you encounter that, understand this. You will never hear things like math and science, achievement, a, a, a meritocracy, uh, entrepreneurship, college readiness. You're not going to hear those things when we're talking social and emotional learning. This is all about adopting and brainwashing and whitewashing your kids' minds, uh, making them tools, not educated individuals. Alex, thanks for another big report. We're going to keep an eye on this one over the next few months.
All right, for today's final story, we are going to California where Governor Jerry Brown just signed into law AB 2601. And basically this law extends this comprehensive sex education not only in public and private schools, but now all charter schools have to teach comprehensive sex education. Um, it basically, it extends the California Healthy Youth Act, and you should take a look at this, uh, re- listeners. Um, it now includes charter schools giving students in grades 7 to 12 comprehensive sexual healthy education and HIV prevention education. And this is going to be started in the 2019-2020 school year. Now, of course, Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California, the ACLU, and the Act for Women and Girls all rejoiced. Yeah, and we said this was coming. This is one of those really important we told you so's. For all of you conservatives out there, including in Wisconsin, my state, who are ignoring what's happening in the schools, the sexualization of the curriculum with comprehensive sex education, everything we spent an hour talking about on the show, rather than a deal with that, rather than address the plummeting standards, rather than address the substitution of real education, uh, 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 achievement-based education, for all the sociology, instead of taking on head-on the sexualization of our younger and younger kids, we all sit, instead say school choice is the answer. We'll let the public schools get worse and worse, and we'll, as Republican lawmakers, push school choice. Charter schools, send your kid to a charter school. Here's what happens. We told you it was going to happen. Because the charter schools all take state and or federal money, that means the states and or the feds get to tell the charter schools ultimately what they can do. Your your first year your kids in charter school might be great. Charter school can do whatever it wants. But as you see in California, sooner or later, the state and the feds are going to pull that string. You want to be a charter school now in California, the same stupid, sexually inappropriate garbage that are being handed out to public school kids in middle school now, you have to do it too, charter school. So that which the parents ran away from to go to the safe charter school is now what the safe, the safe charter school is teaching. This is a serious, serious thing now. Private schools in California, charter schools in California must teach the same radical, comprehensive sexuality curriculum that the public school teaches, right? There you have it. So there's no way to avoid this anymore. There are no safe places. Any school that's taken money from the states or the feds, any school that has to bow down before a state or a federal regulatory agency is going to have to conform. And I wish our Republican, so-called conservative and Republican lawmakers would recognize this. By pushing charter schools, you are just pushing different ways to receive the same crappy political education. You are not fixing the problem. You are not rolling up your sleeves and pulling out of the public schools unnecessary sex. You are not rolling up your sleeves and forcing math teachers to teach math, not cultural education. You are not forcing public school teachers to give zeros for zero work. What you're doing is you are contributing to a system that is equally corrupt. You are corrupting parents by letting them think a charter school education is going to protect them from what the public schools are doing. It's a cop-out. I'm not even talking to the Democrats. You're a lost cause, you progressives. This is what you want. You want an education system that is sociologically and socialistically based, not educationally based. Okay, you got it. Where are you Republicans on all of this? Where are you? Donald Trump. Uh, Because Betsy DeVos does not seem to be one as she's linking up with global agendas when it comes to education who's going to fight this very much. And with that, make sure you head on over to drdukeshow.com and subscribe to us on your favorite platform. Uh, Listen to the podcast version, whether you're in the car, whether you're at home, you're doing the dishes, you're out mowing the lawn, anything. Just listen to us again on your favorite platform. And that does it for us this week on The Dr. Duke Show. Again, as Katie said, if you like what you heard, subscribe, urge your friends to subscribe. It's free. It really helps us out. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. Guys, keep your knees apart when you sit. Keep reaching for the stars. We'll see you next time.